Hey co-stars, welcome to another episode of Generation Films. My name is British Ben, and in this video, we are gonna be looking at 10 more features of the Enterprise E in Star Trek. Now, I know I have done a 10 features video for this ship before, but this time we're gonna be digging even deeper to all those little features that you may have forgotten about, like Geordie's secret closet for hiding bodies in. Like seriously, why does he have a human body size closet with restraints installed in engineering. And also, what about the fact that the Enterprise E just seems to attract Worf? It's like a Worf attracting array. Like at this point, Worf has already been transferred to Deep Space Nine, but every time there's an important mission, he seems to show up. I have a patient here who insists on coming to the bridge. I'll come aboard the Enterprise E, Mr. Worf. Captain, Mr. Worf. Dr. Worf. What the hell are you doing here? So those are the first two movies, and then in Star Trek Nemesis, he joins the crew for Riker and Troy's wedding, and he just sticks around for the whole movie with no explanation. Are you all right? Romulan ale should be illegal. It is. But anyway, some of these features you will know, and some of them are pretty obscure, and you probably won't have heard them before. So here are 10 more features of the Enterprise E in Star Trek. Number one. Captain's Yacht. Now the idea of a detachable spacecraft at the bottom of the saucer section has existed for a long time. We see it on the original Enterprise in this 1960s comic book. It also existed on the Enterprise D as the Captain's Yacht, but it was one of the things that we never got to see in the show. It was a non-warp capable executive spacecraft for transporting the Captain or VIPs over short distances, like down to a planet from orbit. But in the movie Star Trek Insurrection, the second movie featuring the Enterprise E, we do finally get to see a captain's yacht. It's a new design to the one in the Enterprise E, and this time it does have warp nacelles, and it fits into the same place as it did on the Enterprise D, the bottom of the saucer section. The captain's yacht was designed by legendary Starship designer John Eaves, who said a lot of effort was required to design it in a way that it would fit under the quantum torpedo launcher on the bottom of the Enterprise E's saucer section. At 110 feet long, the captain's yacht was actually a sizable vessel. In the movie, we get to see that it has a large internal cargo bay at the back with doors that open directly onto the Enterprise. The yacht was equipped with weapons, and in the movie, Data uses it to fire tachyon bursts at the sonar ship to create a break in their shields so transporters can be used. We don't actually find out what happened to the yacht in the movie Insurrection, but in one deleted scene, it is basically implied that that the yacht was destroyed. Data says he is having trouble entering the atmosphere and he beams out, leaving the yacht probably to burn up. And that was just a placeholder transporter effect, probably so the director could get an idea of what it looked like and because they never finished the scene, they didn't change it to the real effect. Anyway, moving on. Number two, manual steering column. Now we see the manual steering column also in the movie Star Trek Insurrection, which was directed by Jonathan Frakes, the actor who plays Commander Riker. So understandably, he made himself look like an absolute boss in the movie. If one of their weapons hits that gas. It's our only way out of here, Mr. Daniels. I wouldn't be surprised if history remembers this as the Riker maneuver. If it works. Oh wow, Riker, you're such a hero with your maneuvers. Anyway, in order to perform the Riker maneuver, which involved collecting unstable gas, then venting that out in the direction of enemy ships to be ignited by their weapons fire whilst the Enterprise swiftly escapes, you need a manual steering column. This came up from the floor on the Enterprise E bridge and it resembled something like a video game joystick. Producer Rick Berman came up with the idea and Jonathan Frakes apparently liked it, saying in the DVD commentary that he thought that it would appeal to younger audiences. Personally, I feel that this was a missed opportunity. Why would a manual steering column from the 24th century look exactly the same as a 20th century video game joystick. I think a full body control system, something like we see in Pacific Rim, would be much more realistic and cool. Much more worthy of the Riker maneuver. <laughs> anyway, let's move on. Number three, hollow view screen. When designing the ship, the Enterprise E for first contact, one of the things on the list to design was a new bridge. Like the ship, the bridge was designed by John Eaves. Now in the concept sketches, you see a traditional type view screen, but in Star Trek First Contact, they opted for just a wall with no view screen. You can see it here behind Data. When they wanted to see the outside, they would switch to a kind of 2D holographic projection that would appear in front of the bulkhead. On screen. 
and that's a little bit unbelievable for me. You're telling me that at the battle of Sector 001, when this was going on outside, all of the crew members just sat there only getting readings from instruments and didn't actually see what was going on until Picard says on screen. Yeah, I don't think so. A view screen that is constantly there, always showing you what the outside looks like, is far more believable. Would you go on a plane with no windows? No, you wouldn't. In the later movies, they did switch it back to a more traditional view screen. And that screen was the same as in the concept art by John Eves. Number four, bridge airlock. Now the Enterprise E actually has direct access to space through an airlock. And this is probably not that widely known because in the movie, you don't really see the relation of the airlock to the bridge. You don't really see where it is. And I'm gonna show you some probably never before seen concept art in this section as well, because when we did our last video on the Enterprise E, Christopher Cushman, who worked on some of the artistic design for the movie, reached out to us with some concept sketches. So when we see the characters exit the ship in spacesuits in first contact, you may not realize they actually exited from an airlock on the bridge before proceeding to walk across the hull to fight the Borg. We can see a two airlock marker in John E's concept art. And here is the sketch that designer Christopher Cushman provided to the first contact art department that shows how the airlock and kitting up area connects to the doorway in John Eve's concept. He also provided an ultra wide angle lens shot where you can see the entire layout of the set. And it makes sense that the bridge module would have its own airlock because in Star Trek, bridge modules have their own life support system. So even if life support on the entire ship had failed, some of the crew could shelter on the bridge and await rescue through an airlock. I mean, they could also be transported out using transporters, but I don't know, maybe there's an ion storm going on outside. It's always an ion storm that prevents use of the transporters. Number five, warp core ejection system. Or should we say a warp core ejection system that actually works? Because the one on the Enterprise D was always offline. We've got to eject the core. Ejection systems offline. But anyway, on the Enterprise E, it actually worked and they could actually eject the core. Here's how it looked in some concept art. And Geordie LaForge does actually eject the core in the movie Star Trek Insurrection. Eject the core. I just did. Although the movie's budget seems to have prevented us from actually seeing the core eject from the ship. However, we do see a CGI warp core flying towards a subspace tear and then exploding. Number six, bioneural circuitry. Bioneural circuitry consisted of living cells in gel packs instead of the more traditional Star Trek isolinear optical chips. Think of it as brain cells instead of microchips. We see bioneural circuitry on the USS Voyager. We never actually see on screen that the Enterprise E has this kind of circuitry. However, it is stated in the novel trilogy, The Q Continuum, by Greg Cox that the Enterprise E does indeed have bioneural circuitry. And it does make sense that the Enterprise E would have this kind of circuitry because it was built around the same time, if not later than Voyager. Now, this kind of circuitry could speed up computer response time, but the disadvantage was that it was alive, like it would be affected by viruses. The spores must have traveled through that intake and then into the ventilation system. Where they were disseminated throughout the ship subsequently infecting the bioneural circuitry. Yep, there's that one episode of Voyager where spores come out of a bit of moldy cheese and they contain a virus that affects the bioneural system. Captain, the bioneural network is failing sequentially. We're losing systems faster than we can compensate with backups. But the Enterprise E was not stranded 70,000 light years from home and thus they could replace the bioneural gel packs if they were damaged. Number seven library. Yep, there was a library on board and we see a little bit of this in the movie Star Trek Insurrection, but it just looks like a small room. But this scene was actually heavily cut and when you watch the full deleted scene in the DVD extras, you see that it is actually a library with physical books, with people researching stuff and even a librarian telling people to shush. But okay, maybe a library isn't the most interesting of things. How about some weapons? Number eight transphasic torpedoes. Now we see transphasic torpedoes in the last episode of Star Trek Voyager Endgame and one or two torpedoes could destroy an entire Borg cube. Fire transphasic torpedoes. Now, while we see the Enterprise E firing quantum torpedoes at the Battle of Sector 001, 
we don't see transphasic torpedoes in any of the movies. However, in the book Greater Than the Sum, the Enterprise E did use transphasic torpedoes in hit and run missions against the Borg. It was the only weapon that the Borg had not adapted to. It worked by firing a subspace compression pulse, whatever that is. Now the pulse consisted of multiple phase states and the shields on the Borg cube could only block one component of the pulse at a time, letting the other components get through, doing damage. Okay, I don't fully understand it, just trust me, that's how it worked. And every torpedo had a different configuration. Number nine. Type 11 shuttlecraft. All right, now we're talking about some auxiliary spacecraft. So in our first video on the Enterprise E, we mentioned that the ship had a wing of McCall class attack fighters that we never actually got to see in any of the movies. But we did get to see the Type 11 shuttlecraft. It is a warp capable shuttle with an onboard transporter. It was capable of both space and atmospheric flight and was powered by a leaky steam engine. Okay, joke about the steam engine. The set used for the bridge was actually a heavy redress of the runabout set from Deep Space Nine. The shuttle also had docking clamps and an airlock on top of the ship for boarding other vessels, and a collection of sing-along songs in the shuttle's computer. His bosom should heave, and his heart should glow, and his fist be ever ready for a knockdown blow. And I'm gonna leave it there with the Type 11 shuttle because I want to devote more time for talking about our final feature of the Enterprise E, which is another auxiliary vehicle. Number 10, the Argo. The Argo was a Type 17 heavy transport shuttle, again designed by John Eves. I think at the beginning we should just say all the cool stuff is designed by John Eves. John, if you're watching this man, we would love to have you as a guest on the show. Anyway, it was a cool spaceship. The Argo, it's a spaceship. It goes, it goes everywhere. It goes all all throughout space. Yep, it goes all over space. Not sure what that means. It means Argo f yourself. Anyway, don't get it confused with the cool spaceship that goes all over space from the fake sci-fi movie within the Ben Affleck movie, Argo. The Argo was a shuttle with recessed warp nacelles capable of warp 1.65. It also had fold-down wings for atmospheric flight. The folding wings were inspired by World War II carrier base planes such as the Grumman Avenger and the Hellcat, according to John Eves. It was used in Star Trek Nemesis to go down to the surface of a planet. And why couldn't they use the transporters? I wouldn't recommend using the transporter. That ion storm doesn't look very neighborly. Oh, yep, ion storm. So they used the Argo. It could land on the surface of the planet and deploy a special ground vehicle called the Argo as well. They were both called the Argo. This vehicle was lightly armored. It was basically a UTV, but it did have a kind of phaser bazooka at the back for defending yourself from primitive tribal populations. Basically, this thing was a Honda Talon. Here's one I rented in Cabo. Although they didn't give me the option for the bazooka thing. Maybe that's extra. Anyway, with the Argo, we see probably one of the most unrealistic things done in any of the next generation movies. You see, the Argo shuttle has a remote control. It's kind of like the Tesla of shuttlecraft and you could fly it by remote from its parking space until you're ready to board, and then, well, yeah. I'm surprised that wasn't a J.J. Abrams movie. <laughs> anyway, guys, that is the video for today. Now, if you can think of any more features, because this is our second time we've done a 10 features video, and all these features were different from the ones in the first 10 features of the Enterprise E, so if you can think of any more, please leave them below. I think we're gonna be really scraping the barrel, but hey, if we do manage to get 10, I may even do a part three. It's kind of crazy, but maybe. All right, guys, leave your comments below. Please subscribe to the channel if you're new, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.